like I mentioned, my name is Anlai Nelius. I'm the CEO and the creative director of a tiny, tiny indie developer in Sweden, in Stockholm, Sweden, called Valiant Game Studio. We're just two people working full time. Um, and I would like to share our experience of uh, making games today. Uh, I personally have been working with games since 2011, depending on how you count, uh, at companies such as uh, Paradox, Lionbyte, uh, I've been a teacher at Future Games and so on. I've also been a solo indie developer for a while. Uh, and sometimes I role play and LARP, that's why sometimes I look like an elf. And sometimes I wear armor because I like history, just so you know why I have this, these images here. Uh, and at Valiant, we do two different things. We develop a game called Pendula Swing. And it's, it's an episodic adventure game set in a fantasy version of the American Roaring Twenties. Uh, and we released the final episode, the seventh episode of this game, uh, well, uh, later, well, uh, in late this year, in uh, November this year. We also offer consulting to other indie developers through a service that we call Brindy. So basically, we, uh, we can help you with your Kickstarter, with your Steam page, with press releases and so on. And how all this came to be? Well, that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, but first off, I think I need to explain what I mean by the post-apocalyptic wasteland. Uh, of course, this is a bit of a joke and exaggeration, uh, but let's see where like, the thought of an apocalypse comes from. It went black. Here we go. Uh, so in 2012-2013, uh, a lot of like indie darlings such as like Fez, Thomas Was Alone, Papers, Please, and so on, were released to the market. Also, there was a, a movie made about being an indie developer. It was called the Indie Game: The Movie. And like I think some people look at this like as a golden era or something for indie devs people start to see that being a small developer wasn't just possible, it could actually be hugely profitable. Um, so I think this is like where the image of like the indie developer was born, and some people look at this period with nostalgia. But nothing lasts forever. Uh, things started changing. Uh, so you might be aware that uh, Steam launched its Greenlight initiative, and in, I think it was 2000 and, yes, in 2012. So that meant that just about anyone could release their games on Steam. Before that, that wasn't actually the case. You had to pretty much know someone at Valve to release your games. Uh, but now, just about anyone could do it. Anyone who could just uh, tell enough people to vote for them in green light. Also, Unreal 4 uh, became free, uh, or at least there is a free license, which wasn't the case before that. And Tools like Unity uh, also, like it grew, it became more and more valid as a game engine. And already there were like dark clouds on the horizon at this point. Some people already argued that uh, another, like I'm mostly going to focus on Steam in this talk, but another platform, the App Store, had already, according to some people, sort of collapsed at this point because there was such an influx of like small indie that, or like small games and apps on this marketplace that people felt that it was too crowded and like it had eaten itself up. There was no way you could like uh, break through on App Store anymore. And yeah, time progressed. In 2015, uh, there were 2,964 games released on Steam. If you compare that, uh, there were 379 in 2012 and 565 uh, in 2013, respectively. So there was quite a bit of an increase over just a few, uh, a few years on Steam. Oh no, of course this was the apocalypse. You know, the, the market had eaten itself up, like it would break, it was impossible to make games. So this is where some people, some ironically, and some dead serious started talking about like an indie apocalypse. Like it was an apocalypse, like no one could make small games anymore. It was, this was the end of indie dev as we knew it, basically. And things kept changing, as they always do. Between 2015 and now, more things have happened. Tools such as Blender, for example, is getting more and more viable as a game, like as a 3D. Uh, tool. 
it's getting like, it's very accessible because it's free, it's open source, and it's getting on the level of Maya and other tools. More and more game educations are available now. People can actually learn in school how to make games. Uh, in uh, I believe it was I can't see my full notes, but I think it was 2017. Uh, Steam scrapped the Greenlight uh, initiative, and we have what we have today, which is Steam Direct. So now, basically, anyone with, a, with any kind of budget can release their games on Steam. And of course, like the asset store has a bunch of assets, the unit asset store. It's like you don't even really have to know how to make graphics to release a game. All of this makes it just easier to make and launch your game. And it as well has made an impact on the market. This is, these are figures from Steam, uh, from um, GDC last year, uh, or actually, well, anyway, they were uh, talked about last year. Uh, so in 2018, 9,050 games were released on Steam. Compare that to like the golden years of 2012 and 2013, it was like three, four, five hundred games. And also compare that to 2015, where 2,964 games were released. It just keeps growing for every year. So, if the, in the apocalypse happened in 2015, surely now we live in the post-apocalyptic wasteland. Maybe the post-indie apocalyptic wasteland. Hmm, okay. How bad is it? Uh, I want us to do some math. These are numbers from GDC last year. So um, the average game on Steam uh, will sell about 2,000 copies. Um, and in its first month, uh, it will make 12,500 US dollars in revenue. This is like, and this is not counting asset flips and obvious like trash games. This is actually like quote unquote legit games. Also, the average game on Steam will make 30,000 US dollars in its first year. Okay, so 30,000 US dollars in its first year. We are a tiny studio. Granted, Sweden is an expensive country, but still, we're a tiny studio. And our running cost per month is, well, it depends on the month, but give or take 13,000 US dollars a month. If you take that times 12, you get 156,000 US dollars. As you can see, that's a lot less, or that's a lot more than uh, 30,000 US dollars that we can expect to make from one game uh, a year on Steam. So the math just doesn't add up. But still, we are alive. Uh, we just celebrated two years uh, as a game company on Halloween this year. October 31st, and granted, two years isn't that long a time, sure, but we are still around, and if nothing you know, goes completely south, we will be for a while longer. So how is this? How do we survive? Well, as we see it at Valiant, uh, there are four ways that you can make money, basically. Um, you can bootstrap, that's the first thing that you can do. That means like using your own money, maybe reaching out to friends and family for small loans. Taking a bank loan also goes into this category, basically. You can get a publisher, of course. That's kind of like the go-to thing to do. Uh, who hopefully funds your development and helps you market the game once it's done. You can get an investor that invests in your company. So you get like uh, money for a longer period of time that you sort of have to pay back to them uh, by hopefully earning that money back and some more. And of course, you can find other ways, alternative ways of making money while you are developing your game. At Valiant, we are funded by three of these being, we bootstrapped in the beginning using some of our personal funds to start a company. Uh, we have investors in the company and also we have found alternative ways of making money as well. And this is the part where I kind of go into a little bit more detail about how we have done it at Valiant. So to shed a little bit more light on this, um, 
let's talk about like how our philosophy is to begin with at Valiant. It's been very important to us to not do it like so we have uh, seen a lot of especially like maybe young developers like they have this magnum opus like this big game that they want to make and then they kind of like build a company because they have to uh, for us it was very important to sort of do it the other way around to like start to build a company that was sustainable and like could help us make the games we want to make for a long period of time which might sound like the same thing but it's actually uh, something that was built to last in the long run so we're building this company more like a tech startup uh, rather than like a normal quote-unquote game company Let's see if i can get the rest of my notes so i see everything nope i can't okay uh, so like we still have ideals and we have still have things that we want to do we want to change the world basically with our games um, but like building the company uh, is like the starting position. So like we are still visionaries and we still want to make good games, of course, but we feel like the company is the foundation that would help us do that. And this takes time and time is money. So the challenge for us has been to like find a way to be sustainable uh, and you know, to stay alive until we can be profitable on like what we see as our core activities, which is making and publishing games. Uh, okay, so to go into more detail, uh, let me share the story of Valiant with you. Uh, and for this, uh, we uh, need to go back to 2016. Back then, I was a, so I was a solo indie developer, uh, and I was also a game design teacher and a freelancer. So I kind of wanted to like go back to the basics. I want to focus on one project and one company. So I joined something that's called a pre-incubation program in Stockholm. Um, as you might know, an incubator like is where you go and like they help you build a company. This was like a, a taste of that basically. So they provided contacts and workshops and so on uh, to kind of like help us build a company. And then about a year later, I joined this incubator for real, quote unquote, and uh, along with another person. Uh, this developer slash musician that I knew. Uh, we really like kicked off the company. Um, the incubator helped us to get a business coach. They made interest to influential people and so on. During this time, I also found a freelancer for the art and I started making the game, Pendulum Swing. Uh, and at that time, uh, Pendulum Swing was planned as a premium game, as most games are. Uh, meaning like one product that would be released, released at one period in time. But I planned it with a chapter-like structure. So like if we didn't get all of the funding that we needed, we could pick out some parts and still the story would make sense. Um, I also made sure to quickly build an advisory board of influential people in the industry who could give us some legitimacy and also some support while building the company. So this is the game that we decided to make, Pendula Swing. As mentioned, is, it's an episodic adventure game set in a fancy version of the American Roaring Twenties. You play as a hero who has already saved the world and you retired. And now you come back to a world that's very different from what you're used to. Uh, the world now has orcs and goblins and so on roaming the streets freely. They actually want the right to vote now and so on. So we use this game to talk about uh, social disparities, like economic problems and so on, with, you know, a fun twist because it's orcs and goblins. We, we play around with tropes a lot. So we started this game, like I said, uh, just over two years ago. And the final episode, number seven, was released in mid-November this year. We made it in Unity and mostly have, we have released it on Steam. We also have a free episode on Itch, uh, but Steam is our main platform. We have delivered everything on time and as promised, and the reception has been pretty good. Uh, however, initially this game was pretty buggy when we started releasing it. That meant that the review scores wasn't as good as we wanted them to be, and it does not sell nearly enough for us to sustain ourselves. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. 
So as mentioned, I did start this company with the help of another person uh, who did not actually end up joining the company, so to speak. So I really needed and wanted a co-founder. Uh, so what is now my co-worker Lara Belaka uh, joined this company in March 2018. So this is a picture of us from Sweden Game Conference this year, uh, where we gave a very serious business development talk wearing hedgehog onesies, because our logo is a hedgehog. So actually, if you take a picture of this presentation now, you will have a picture of presentation with a picture of presentation with a picture of a presentation. Just saying. Um, anyway, so we had a quite unusual situation in this company, we still have. Uh, which is that we have two people in like the core of the company that both are very interested in business development and so on. And we could both technically be CEOs. In fact, next year we might even switch, so she becomes CEO uh, and I will not be anymore. Just like try it out. Um, and when she joined, we had a long and hard discussion about the company strategy. Because we knew that we needed money, of course, at least enough to finish a prototype of the game that we could pitch to publishers. So what we did is that we made an inventory of what our incubators thing offered and recommended in terms of funding. Also, she and I, like we have almost 30 years of combined experience in the games industry, so we had uh, quite a network of people that we could reach out to, um, to like get their help and also like, hi, do you want to fund our company, like they want to invest in us. So we started building a publisher and an investor list quite early. Also, almost immediately after she joined, uh, we decided to make Pendulous Swing an episodic game. And this was for several reasons. Uh, first of all, we weren't uh, willing to risk developing like a premium game, like sitting in a basement for five years and then hopefully making it once we finally released it. That to us was way too risky because we had no idea how the target audience would receive this game. Uh, also, we felt the need to prove the concept to ourselves and to everyone else. Uh, we knew that Episodic would give us the uh, steady marketing beat um, that we wanted to kind of build a community. This also meant that we could give the first episode for free to like, gather an audience, like get a lot of players in very quickly and like uh, reach out to them. Also, almost immediately, we decided to see what a publisher reaction would be to this game. So we aimed for a few publishers uh, that we liked and that were kind of like in line with our way of thinking, that had like games that kind of uh, reminded us of, uh, of this one. However, they gently turned us down. Uh, this led us to decide that we wanted to go with investors instead. Uh, because it was kind of clear that these publishers weren't really seeing what we wanted them to see in this game. So we wanted to find people who really believed in us as developers and who were willing to be in it for the long game. Uh, because as you might be aware, publishers invest in games, in you know, unique game titles, whereas investors invest in the full company. And uh, it was very crucial for us to find the right partners in this business endeavors. You know, it always is. But especially when it comes to investors, it's really important to find what's good for you because they're going to be there for a long period of time. Hopefully. Um, and releasing one episode every third month, which is what we decided on, that means a lot of work. Uh, not just on the development side, and trust me, it was enough on that side, but also from the marketing side. So every Pendulous Swing episodes, episode needs a storefront on Steam. Uh, it needs a lot of graphics and descriptions and other materials. Um, also, it means a release for every episode, which means social media presence, which is more assets. Uh, we need for Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and press releases and so on. It was just a lot of work for one person, me, that being Laura, to do. This meant that we kind of organically moved towards simplifying and improving this work. And that resulted in a collection of asset sizes and templates and vector graphics that uh, Laura made available on GitHub. And this is how Brindy was born. Today, Brindy is a free resource uh, of asset sizes, templates, and guides on how to self-publish your game on some 20 storefronts and services. 
So for those uh, who need it, Brindy is also a fixed cost a la carte publishing service. So basically, if you would use this, you would give us your existing marketing assets and we prepare 100% your storefronts, fundraising campaigns, social media presence, or whatever you need. Uh, we are also capable of handling PR, management, uh, marketing, and community management. Right. So our first investor-focused uh, pitches uh, that we did were in February 2018. So right about the time just before Laura joined. And the first pitch that gave us some, you know, some return of investment, so to speak, uh, was uh, to a network of angel investors, so like individual uh, people, basically, uh, that were connected to the in incubator that we were in. And apparently they liked what they heard. So this gave us enough to sustain ourselves a little bit longer, at least long enough to secure uh, more funding. When we later decided to go all in on the investor side, we pretty much shook every tree that we could find to like see what would fall out. And what finally hit the first jackpot for us was another tech startup who had an investor who we were introduced to. And uh, he really knows games. He is an investor in a Swedish company called Fatshark that you might he have heard of. Uh, so that means he actually knows games, which was really nice. And he brought an associate aboard as well. Because for us, it's been very important to bring in quote unquote smart money. That means like money that also has a person or a company attached to it that knows what you're doing and that really believes in you. It can also bring in some form of experience and help to the company. Also in the winter between 2018 and 2019, uh, we opened another round and took in additional capital. Uh, and this time it was like enough for us to grow for a longer period of time. This time, uh, game dev uh, veteran Susanna Meza Graham, who is known for her work at Paradox, uh, joined as an investor. By February this year, 2019, we could finally focus full on, on finishing all the episodes of Pendulous Swing and start bringing in some actual money with Brindy because we didn't have to like chase down investors and like worry about the future as much anymore. So we could breathe a little bit for a while. And today, we, like I said, we have just launched the final episode of Pendulous Swing and we are still supporting it. We are still fixing bugs, we are still making the game better and better for free for the existing players that we have and hopefully new players as well. We also plan to re-release this game as one big product, like one premium product in early 2020. Uh, Brindley has started to bring on some promising revenue. Uh, we are also still updating our work and uh, our strategy based on our past errors. We focus a lot on our future. Uh, we plan long term and we make extensive efforts to capitalize on what we already have uh, to get some recoup of the investments that we have already done into different like projects. Uh, we also look at what hobby projects we have, like other things that we're doing that could possibly be turning to something that will give us a profit. So the good news is that presently we can, we can survive for about another year-ish with what we have in the bank today. The bad news is this is not thanks to the games we're making, or well, the game. Last time we checked, only about 6.5% of the money that we make come from actual game sales. So how do we survive until 2020? Uh, we internally use the motto valiantly onwards because we are very committed to the success of this tiny company. And to us, success means stability for as much time as we can muster. So we hustle and we pivot and we stay open to possibilities and we pay a lot of attention to where our money and our effort and our time is spent. Because every successful studio that we are aware of, or at least most of them, they struggled at some point or another. Like Rovio, they released 52 games before Angry Birds. And Blizzard, for example, they did outsource work. They worked for others for at least like eight years or something before really focusing on their own games. And I'm sure that a lot of people here, if you're not struggling right now, you probably have or will at some point in time. 
So we're not worried that right now we're not doing exactly what our core activities are, because it's a means to an end. We will get there in time. And as a whole, the games industry is booming and it's growing. There is so much money to be made. I don't know about other countries around the world. I don't have numbers to compare with, but at least like in Sweden, we're a tiny, tiny company uh, or a tiny, tiny country. Uh, but we made 1.87 billion euros in revenue to 2018. Like compare that to the supposed like golden year, so 2012, 2013. Like it's, it's crazy, it keeps growing. And like, sure, there are more games in the market. There are also more players. There is more money to make. So here's a lukewarm take. It's not a hot take, it's pretty lukewarm, but the indie apocalypse is not and never has been a thing. Making games has always been hard. Uh, it's just harder in other way now. Like, before it would be hard to even like get your hands on a good game engine, like the tools that you need and the education and so on. Like, that's available to anyone now. Like, the tools and the knowledge have been democratized. And this is good. Like, people from across the globe can make games, will express themselves through games, which is awesome. So the question is just, how do you use that power? Where do you put your attention? So the challenge, more now than any, at any time, is to stand out and possibly finding a turn to sources of revenue. So, like, you have to be extra smart about your IP and the assets that you make. And by that I mean, like, how can you use what you already have in a smart way? How can you, like, maybe make a second game in the same universe, reusing stuff that you already have? Uh, and even more than any, at any point in time, it's so important to focus on your target audience, really define that, really talk to them and see what it is that they want, to, want you to make. Because the competi competition is so fierce. And like I said, are there other ways to make money? So for us, as mentioned, this means that we are working on a lot of you know, projects in parallel. We have, so to speak, put our eggs in several different baskets, just to be sure. We're making our own games, Pendulous Swing. Uh, we're also helping others with their games. This is, for example, a Kickstarter campaign that we helped out with that was 220% funded or something. It's called Sestria. You should actually check it out. It's really cool. Uh, I can say that because I didn't work on it myself. Um, we have Brindy, our service. And like I said, also we're checking out, like we're looking at our hobby projects. This is uh, Laura's side project, Hard People Supporter which it kind of worked on like in her spare time for a long period of time. And now we hope to next year actually launch this. So instead of building like one big magnum opus, we have diversified and we have adapted to what the market actually looks like today. So here are some key takeaways. Um, there are alternative ways of making money besides just making games. It's very important to find your target audience and to stick to it. We can see this so clearly with Pendula Swing. Like when we have actually find, found like a clique of people that really respond to what we do, it's so gratifying to see that the yeah, they keep coming back and you can see like that group expanding. And also that's how, why it's extra important to like to make another game that though those people will also like. So we can kind of carry over our our current fan base to the next game as well. Be open to pivot. And by pivot, I mean have plans, make plans, absolutely, but also be ready to change them. If you feel like what you're doing is not working, then maybe try to change that. Like go to where the money is. Doesn't sound like, like the indie dream, but it's true. Like if you want to make another game, uh, that's what you need to do. If you can, strive to have like a diverse portfolio. And by that I mean like maybe instead of making one big game, can you make maybe smaller games? That so like you have several games that have a high success, like higher success of one of them being a hit. Like can you make smaller projects uh, for uh, like so that you you quickly come to the point where you can make something that really makes money. As always, like find ways to be unique and like 
the, this market as it is today, it's even more important than ever to actually stand out and not just change, uh, chase the next trend, or like change the current trend. Uh, don't plan your magnum opus like that big thing that you're going to be famous for uh, and just build a company because you have to. The company is so important and like having a strategy. Like I said, also keep your IP in mind. What can you do with what you're building? Uh, and like, can you reuse stuff in the future? And if all of this has been really boring to you, well, maybe you're not the person who should be in charge of business development. Maybe you should be CEO of the company. Uh, if you have one of those, uh, find some th someone who actually thinks that this is a lot of fun and interesting. Uh, it's fine to just want to focus on making games, absolutely. But if everyone in your team is that kind of person, maybe you should try to reach out to someone who thinks that this is like this is fun, because otherwise it's going to be hard to really succeed. I think. As for Valiant. Uh, our dream for the future is, of course, to become comfortably sustainable, so we really can breathe out and focus on what we want to do. And also, of course, we want to make our investors the money back, so we feel like, so they feel like they, they did a good investment. Uh, we don't necessarily have to be a large studio. The most important thing for us is that we can make the games that we want to make. And what that is, well, that's for the future to show. And when we can start relaxing a little bit more, we want to create games that make a positive impact on the world in some way. And we also want to help others make games and bring uh, other games to the market through our publishing, especially underappreciated uh, games and uh, developers. And that's everything I wanted to share with you today. Thank you so much.